Um, just to say, I'm Jill Rutter. It's the UK and a Changing Europe event. We're going to launch Matt Bevington's report. Matt was just uh, just kicking off there on uh, how to uh, on his report on Whitehall in Brussels. We're joined by Katrina Williams, uh, EU veteran from government now in the Scottish government as Director General of External Affairs, but also our last ever Deputy Permanent Representative, Sir Stephen Wall. Uh, former EU permanent re UK permanent representative to the EU, former EU Sherpa and Ulf Sverdrup, uh, director of the Norwegian Institute for International Affairs, who is going to give us a third country perspective. We're going to start with Matt. And then Matt, I'm going to have to ask you to row back quickly and just uh, giving us some highlights from his report. And then we will go into a discussion. And please, if you have questions, could you please post them into the chat in the, not the chat into the Q&A and apologies for that that was a problem uh, because of uh, my technological ineptitude um, so that was entirely on me um, but we will get going and it will be fun and many many apologies there and particular apologies to all our guests Matt, uh, Stephen, Katrina and Ulf but it'll be better second time. Matt you've had a dummy run uh, Matt, what's in your report? Apologies to those who have to hear me drone on twice. That's not fair on anyone. So I was just saying, that, I mean, the purpose of the report really was to try and capture the main developments in Ukrep over its final decade and distill some of that wisdom in one place and also try and draw some lessons for the future, even though it's the, the, it, Ukrep, Ukmis as it now is, finds itself in a very different context. I was just saying that, that the, the, I suppose the major change that's taken place in Brussels is that UKREP or Commiss officials no, are no longer in the in the EU Council negotiating on behalf of the British government. They're obviously still executing British policy in Brussels and in the institutions, but obviously are less, much less, very much less involved in the institutions themselves. And also, I think UKMIS's role in formation of, of EU policy has diminished over recent years and, and is perhaps much less central than it used to be. One of the main trends I was just talking about more broadly was leading up to the, the Brexit referendum and the Brexit process was a wider decline in the pipeline of, see, of senior, senior EU expertise in Whitehall. And that was something that we saw in the, in the Foreign Office, but also in other departments. I think it was probably most obvious in the fact that when John Cunliffe went to be permanent representative in 2011, his replacement at Aegis was Ivan Rogers, who had to be brought back from the private sector. So there was no... There was no other candidate within within the system who uh, could be brought in to do that. We had to reach out to the private sector and that kind of captured the situation we were in in the early 2010s. When we get to the Brexit period, um, UPCREP, I think there, there was quite a lot of upheaval in the entire system, mainly due to the creation of DEXU. The system that had existed up until that point was that there was what's sometimes called an inner core of departments. So UPCREP was one of them the Europe unit in the cabinet office and then the European secretariat in the foreign office alongside the treasury in the prime minister's office. Those departments were, this, were the inner core that really managed EU policy on a day-to-day -day basis. When DEXU was created, it basically blew that system apart, reformed it, and obviously in, in the process reshaped UGREP's relationship and, and position in that process. So instead of UGREP reporting into that inner core, it then had to report to DEXU on day-to-day -day EU policy. And at the beginning, at least, it was largely cut out of negotiations. Um, and I think when you compare the start of the Brexit process, even to the Cameron renegotiation, UCREP was much less involved in the early stages of policy formation. And we know how crucial that was in, in forming later, the, how, how the later process played out. And I should recommend at this point as well, people check out the Brexit archive on the UK and Changing Europe website, because there's quite a few accounts there of how um, the UK's policy was formed in those early days. And actually, it wasn't just UCREP that was excluded from that process. It was lo you know, lots of people in the system who had lots of experience in EU policy, and it was very centralised centralized around Theresa May. I think there was a change in the second stage of the, of the Brexit negotiations in the, the trade agreement. Partly, I think this was because David Frost himself used to work in UCREP and so had, had at least some appreciation for the skills that existed in uh, in the mission and, and valued its expertise. But the fact that it wasn't included in the first stage, I think points to a wider problem that the mission has in being heard and understood in Whitehall. Um, it's okay when, when Frost was, was an ex 
sort of org rep person himself, but actually I think a lot of departments didn't have a, a, a very good appreciation of what org rep did, what value it could bring, or what role it played in delivering their own departmental um, objectives. And I think that's still a problem heading going forward, and perhaps arguably even more of a problem now that EU policy more generally is seen as being less relevant. Since the Brexit process, at least part of the, the formal negotiations came to an end, and, and indeed during the latter stages of it, I think the mission broadly was downgraded, reformed, but still remains big. So the head of mission is now a grade lower than the ambassador, that the EU ambassador as was. The deputy position at, at, has obviously been abolished, and broadly speaking, the senior leadership is now less senior than it was. As I said, the operations have fundamentally changed. We're no longer negotiating. We're largely information gathering and doing perhaps more typical diplomatic tasks uh, in the mission. And although the mission remains large, indeed much larger than many member states still, there is a plan to, de to downsize over time. And I think that, that, that will play out. But it's, it's unclear really what the end game is there in terms of what, what the number should be. So finally, I think I'm... The, the things that I'm thinking about in terms of future are what I'm calling the three P's. So people, purpose, and politics. In terms of people, I think there are serious questions about how the mission continues to attract talent from Whitehall and also retain the talent that it has. And partly that's because the terms and conditions of the job have substantially changed. One of the major attractions of going to Ukrep was that you got to be very quickly involved in negotiations. You were talking to 27 other governments. You were effectively working on legislation that would become law in 28 EU member states. That's a fantastically influential role to have and one that wasn't replicated anywhere else and obviously now doesn't ex exist. So the balance of advantages and disadvantages maybe now has shifted against Stockmiss, but that's something to consider in future. In terms of purpose, I don't think the government has yet, at least publicly certainly it hasn't, set out a strategic purpose for the mission. We've had the integrated review this week, but it's largely silent on, e on the EU more broadly and certainly doesn't say anything about what the mission's purpose is in terms of delivering government objectives. But I think the government should see the EU as a venue for, for pursuing its wider ambitions. But, uh, you know, for political reasons, um, it's not keen to talk about that. But it, it's a shame. And I think from the perspective of UK businesses, I'm sure they would love a very active and vocal British government presence in Brussels still. And I, I think that's something that eventually should be aimed for. Finally, politics. I mean, it doesn't really matter in the end, or it matters less what we do at the official level in Brussels if the, if the, if the relations at the political level are as toxic as they have been and continue to be. I mean, th this is a, a trend that goes way back throughout UK-EU relations, but I think is a particularly um, salient issue at the minute. While ever politics remain so conflictual, the effectiveness of the mission will, will continue to be undermined. And I'm afraid, I don't think there's any short-term prospect of that drastically improving. But one thing I would like to see is that the parliament, inter-parliamentary forum that was negotiated as part of the TCA, that, that at least efforts are made to get that up and running. It's not about really laying the groundwork for rejoining, not at all, it's, but it is about laying the groundwork for having a functional relationship going forward. So I'll leave it there. Okay, thanks very much, Matt. That was brilliant. Uh, very well done. Uh, just to, to people who maybe joined late because of uh, my failure to press the necessary button, um, could you please post questions in the Q&A? And we're not going to go and get people to ask questions themselves um, uh, just because that takes too much time in this format. So if you could uh, write them into the Q&A, that would be brilliant. Uh, rather than put your hand up. I've seen a couple of people put their hands up. I can't look at both the chat and the Q&A. So even if it's a chat, put it in the Q&A, she said. Um, first of all, I'm going to go to Stephen. Stephen, you're a sort of long-term observer of UK-EU relations. I just wondered if you had a sort of view on some of the points that Matt was making, not least on the sort of, you know, the decline that he brings out in his report of interest in the FCO. There's that sort of comment in Kim Darrock's book about how nobody really believed anyone wanted to specialize in the EU in the foreign office. It wasn't very glamorous. And some of the hints in Matt's report that actually the FCO didn't have very good candidates when, uh, uh, when people turned to John Cunliffe and then Ivan Rogers to head up the permanent representative people with more of a treasury background than an FCO background. 
and the loss of EU expertise within Whitehall or interest within Whitehall more generally. Does that resonate with you or yeah, not? I, thought, I mean, I thought Matt's report was, was, was spot on on all, on all counts. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the 80s and perhaps uh, to an extent the early 90s were a kind of high point in a way, and paradoxically and rather surprisingly, it coincides, of course, with Margaret Thatcher's uh, premiership. Um, uh, and the interesting thing about Thatcher was, you know, it was always said of her that you know she liked the Church of England but disliked the people in it, and she hated the Foreign Office but quite liked some of the people in it. And people like uh, Michael Butler, who was the Perm Rep, David Hannay, who was the Perm Rep, Robin Rennick, who was the senior official in the Foreign Office, Charles Pohl, her private secretary, were hugely were hugely uh, influential. Um, and I think there was a sense then, and I certainly benefited uh, from it. Um, working in the department in, in the Foreign Office in the, in the early 80s, that actually we were a kind of race apart, but rather, rather we, didn't, we didn't think of, our, not only did we think of ourselves as rather superior beings, but other people thought of us as rather superior beings. Um, and that, as you say, that, that certainly uh, has long since, long since gone, but it was, uh, it was there. Um, and it was exciting, of course, because um, uh, battling, with the, battling with the EU, I want my money back, was the sort of core of domestic politics, apart from anything else. Things got more, things got more difficult as, as the problems within the Tory party got more difficult after Margaret Thatcher's departure, when loyalty to the fallen leader and being against the European Union became, became synonymous. And then, of course, as Katrina well remembers, under John Major, we went we went through the policy of non-cooperation when the European Union cut off our exports of beef following the mad cow disease thing, and a, and a, and a slightly kind of ridiculous position. And the last thing I was involved in before the Tories lost office in '97 was negotiating what became the Amsterdam Treaty. Uh, Michel Barnier was then the French uh, French representative, and. Um, I used, to get in, I used to get pages and pages of instructions every week signed off by David Davis, the Europe Minister. And I said to the Foreign Office, why bother? Just send me a one-liner saying, and just, just say no. And Brian Bender, who was the head of the European Secretariat in the Cabinet Office, and I said to ourselves, each other, you know, if John Major wins the election, our first question is going to be, is there anything in this treaty to which you can actually agree? Because apparently there wasn't. So, and the other huge thing is, was it, and, and I think, I mean, in terms of the, UK's overall position in Europe. I didn't, I didn't see it at the time. I didn't see it with the opt-out from the Maastricht Treaty, partly because we were as much concerned to ensure our right to opt in as we were to opt out. But the Maastricht, the Maastricht Treaty was, a, was an existential game uh, changer because we divorced ourselves from what became the key core policy of the European Union. And I think actually the path to Brexit starts at the Maastricht Treaty. That's interesting. Did you actually see a sort of different way of operating post Maastricht in terms of actually the UK's involvement in a sort of European core? Or were we always sort of slightly removed because we joined in 1973 rather than being at the inception? Uh, because one of the suggestions, one of the concerns of David Cameron that Ivan Rogers keeps on saying drove uh, his real concerns in the renegotiation was that the UK risked being forever stitched up by the Eurozone countries in caucus beforehand and then... Uh, well, it was, yeah, that was, that was a, and it was a very real risk and, and, uh, and uh, Cameron himself uh, uh, fought against it. And of course, while we were in the EU and had recourse, for example, to the European Court, we could, uh, uh, we, uh, we, we could do that. I think you can overdo the kind of, because we joined late, we, you know, we were at a big, a big disadvantage. I think psychologically we were at a, we were at a disadvantage. It's, it's, a separate, it's a separate issue. Uh, but I think, in, and I think, I think our problem was not so much, you know, that we that we joined late, but al that although we'd signed up to the goals of the European Union, ever closer union, we never really believed in ever closer union. We were constantly trying to make it not the organisation of the institutions that it is, but to make it an intergovernmental thing run by, you know, the large member states. And of course, we never succeeded in that. So Katrina, Stephen's given us a bit of historical perspective. You actually lived through uh, much of this period, uh, moving to be Deputy Permanent Representative in uh, 2017, I think. So what was it actually like living through this period in ArcRep? Were people enthused? There was a bit of a sense back in London that EU expertise was almost a sort of um, cause for a bit of suspicion about how willing you were to pursue Brexit as keenly as the government wanted. So what, what was the atmosphere like in UPREP through this time? It, 
Jill, it was an extraordinary period. Um, I should start by saying, actually, just on that point about enthusiasm to work in in, in UPREP and to work in, in European affairs, um, it remained the case that for those of us who come from Whitehall departments rather than the Foreign Office, um, a posting to UPREP um, still remained uh, throughout uh, all the turbulent history. Um, uh, the most exciting thing that would probably ever happen to you. So actually the quality, enthusiasm and spark of people coming to um, UPREP from Whitehall was, was terrific. Um, when I arrived just after the Article 50 letter, um, I think it was fair to say there were a fair few people in UPREP who had arrived thinking about a year before, thinking that they were going to be uh, doing a UK presidency. So there was a certain amount of um, mind uh, resetting um, going on. I think the second thing I would say is that for us and with our EU partners, there was a genuine sense that there was no playbook. Nobody had ever done this before and nobody knew quite how to behave or quite how the other party would behave. So when I arrived in Kurapa One, um, uh, there had been a short gap before my arrival. And one of my new European colleagues came up to me and said, oh, it's a UK deputy permanent representative. We thought maybe you wouldn't bother with that anymore. So I found myself in the position, A, of having to decide very much how to play things and how to behave in particular circumstances, but also needing to signal to others what I was doing and why I was doing it so that actually people would understand that. I think the other thing to say about the atmosphere was we had a, 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 an amazing amount to do because we were negotiating as member states on legislation that might apply in the UK. We, we didn't really know at the start of the negotiations how close the relationship would be. We were supporting the negotiations. We were supporting DEXEU as a new department with a lot of new civil servants, many of them new to European policy. And we were also doing the work to prepare UPREP to become UPMIS on which we had a huge amount of support and help from the third country missions in Brussels, including the Norwegian mission. So we were, we were all very busy because we were doing multiple different things simultaneously. And that report notes, actually, we did grow in size to, to accommodate all of that. So it was an extraordinary period because many of the, the old ground rules about how you behaved in particular circumstances um, had disappeared. And I think Whitehall departments too felt that they didn't quite know anymore how to brief us. So we were having to sort of remake the world for this rather strange period we found ourselves in. Right, that's really interesting. Um, you hinted there, Katrina, about the preparation for becoming a third country. I've got so many questions going to come in. And I'm going to put the first one to Ulf because it was what I was more or less going to ask him Anyway, which is that, you know, with this transition, this is from John Speed, with this transition to being in, uh, in up miss rather than up rep, I've got so many questions, I'm losing my place. Uh, up miss, you know, the UK is obviously not around the table anymore. It's got to get used to doing that. Um, so question, how will it be able to develop the sort of constructive, we assume that's an ambition, but let's assume that develop the necessary relations with Commission, Council, Parliament, and indeed, you know, what actually, how does it sort of function differently in terms of, in, you know, engaging with the other permanent representatives? Lindsay Appleby is our ambassador, but not a permanent representative, so he's not in Corupa 2, no Katrina equivalent anymore, sitting in Corupa 1. So, Ulf, how do the Norwegians go about operating uh, in the EU, where obviously the rules being made in the EU have a very profound effect on Norway. Um, what's different? What's going to change? Uh, okay, thank you so much, Jill, and thanks to Matt for a great report. I read it. I will not engage that much in the nostalgia of the 
of the former representation. I'll try to look a bit in, uh, into the future, as you alluded to, Jill. I think that uh, the starting point is, of course, that the UK will never be like an ordinary third country. It will be a special one. Uh, but uh, still, uh, and in some sense, some of the Norwegian lessons are less relevant. Yet, uh, the UK, Norway is also important for Europe in some areas, at least. Uh, in particular in energy and some other issues. I think um, uh, the UK has not had taken a bit too lightly on its position as an outsider, because uh, when you have left, the UK has become a third country, and it has turned the UK into a lobby nation, a lobby nation. Um, and I remember that it's, Theresa May once said that life is going to be different, but I suspect that very few have really uh, appreciated the radical consequences following from this change status. I think that um, as a lobbyist and uh, coming closer to the question, I think that in lobbyism, uh, the currency of your action is about the So, oh, you've got a bit uh, inaudible. Is, uh, so when the UK has left the EU, it will no. Uh, sorry. So the the currency of a lobbyist is information, and the currency in Brussels lobby scene is information exchange. So the UK will have less information. They will be less attractive. You have to ask for information. You will no longer be the pen holder. No longer be able to issue linkage and all these instruments that Matt portrayed in his report have been very important for exercising influence in Europe by the UK. So it will be much more of a passive outsider. So I think the whole mission will be a very different location. It will be an arena for intelligence gathering about what is happening rather than trying to shape uh, decision-making in Brussels, I think so. So that's the, the first question. But let, I can also say a few words about how the Norwegian... Tell us uh, a bit about how the Norwegians... Do. Tell us a bit about how the Norwegians do it, Ulf. Yeah, so, so Norway have built up a rather strong mission to, to, uh, to the EU at the size of almost uh, some other small uh, EU countries. It's much bigger now than it was five years ago and much bigger five years ago than it was 10 years ago. It is uh, like uh, a Norway in miniature in Brussels. Uh, it represents uh, not only foreign affairs, uh, foreign ministry, but all uh, ministries have uh, seconded people there. Also in areas where we don't have agreements with the EU. But the mission is just one part, as you know, of Norwegians in Brussels. We have various institutions. And at least pre-COVID, we had a, a morning flight at six o'clock uh, from Oslo to Brussels with experts joined in on expert committee meetings, etc., uh, talking uh, uh, within the framework of the EA agreement on future EU regulations, etc. So, so it's a rather massive uh, network of uh, uh, participants working within the European scene. But many of them have formal positions that I don't think uh, the Brexit agreement or withdrawal agreement put the same foundation for. No, we have a lot of committees, but we're obviously not invited inside in, in quite the same way. We've got quite a lot of questions that I want to put to, put to our, uh, our UK panellists and then interested to get all three reaction to those about what sort of skills does the UK need to do? Ulf has described it as a sort of becoming a lobbyist rather than a negotiator. I think one of the, Matt's points is that this is a key negotiating job. Do we just send the same sort of people who used to go to UCREP or is it a sort of different job now? More diplomats, bigger hospitality budget? I don't know. What's, what's different in the way you have to go about doing business? Uh, Stephen. Well, I think there are two aspects. Of it. One, one is obviously the role of the role of bilateral embassies uh, will increase a lot in terms of actually seeking to influence the member states, and the foreign office is increasing the number of UK-based people in those posts. It was rather run down not 
a perfectly good reason why we were why we were members. I think you. I mean, I think you you are going to you are going to need people who are quite uh, I think quite extrovert and quite prepared to mix it because um, we will be having to try uh, with with our with hands tied behind our back to influence uh, and and not least influence within the European Parliament. And so we are going to have have people who are prepared to go there and and bang on doors and put their foot in put put their foot in the door. Uh, to be heard, because you know we are going to be, as we know, we are going to be rule takers, not rule makers, uh, and actually our need to try and influence uh, legislation and policy, is, if, if anything, gets even, 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 even greater, because we've lost the natural advantage we've had. And will ambitious young foreign office officials think, yes, that's the job for me, or will they think, well, actually, more opportunities in Berlin, Paris, wherever. You know, better parties, more glitz. I think, that, um, I, think, I, think, I think, you know, I don't think we're going to reach any kind of equilibrium if we, if we do at all inside 10 years. So for the, in the short term, yes. In the longer term, I think people will, will again start to see that this actually is a really important uh, uh, place to be and somewhere where actually you can exercise real skills and, and, and a place which, which politically is really, really vital for the for the UK. I mean, that's you know, obviously, in, under this government, and given what's happened, that's now out of fashion. But in a rational view of the UK's interests, the importance of Brussels, the importance of the EU relationship, will come to assert itself again. And this is a bit of a nerdy Whitehall-y point, but is the downgrading for of the uh, status of the ambassador from a permanent secretary position to a director general does that matter? I don't think so of itself. No, I mean the key thing is: do you, do you get do you get the right people? Do you get really good people? And then what? The, what? What? How senior? How senior they are in the UK system isn't really. It's not an issue as far as as far as our former partners are concerned. I would imagine. Okay, Matt. Any thoughts on the skills that is needed in the new UCMIS? Well, I think first of all, you need to be clear about what you're trying to achieve in Brussels, and I. This is what I was saying earlier about I'm not sure the government has put much effort in, at least publicly, into explaining what it wants to achieve in the institutions, partly because it doesn't really want to talk about the institutions. It wants to talk about relationships with member states bilaterally. But in, it sort of reflects the UK's attitude when it was a member state. It was more interested in talking about the bits of the system that it liked, like the council, and it didn't like talking about the bits of the system it didn't like, i.e. the supranational bits of the European Parliament. So until we really have a clear... A clear vision of what we're trying to achieve. It's re it's kind of hard to say what what structure we need, what structures we need in place, and the pe kind of people we need in place. I imagine, um, as Stephen was saying, there will be more sort of diplomatic trade envoy type stuff. But th there's but I mean there's, there's EU legislation which is absolutely fundamental potentially to us mm -hmm. on things like financial services where we need to be extremely active. So so yeah, that's my main point. I think is that the first starting point is strategy, what you're trying to achieve, and then think about the skills you need thereafter. Jill, can I have a go yeah. on, on that? Yeah, I, wanted, that. I was going to ask, add a, another question for you, Katrina, which was also about uh, one of the things that comes out of Matt's report is that, you know, and it comes out of some interviews for the Witness Archive as well, do check it out, as Matt said, is that actually a, a lot of Whitehall departments sort of increasingly marginalised EU interest and, uh, and sort of, looking at these things. So I'm quite interested as well about the sort of counterpart of we have UCMIS sitting there, but what do they need in terms of linkages into Whitehall to be effective? And is there a danger that all those EU teams we saw around will basically uh, be, you know, where you post people you don't really care about anymore and stuff like that? Or will the presence of the TCA me and all those partnership committees and things like that mean that there's lots of interest as a good place to work? Well, I mean, I think, I mean, in terms of the skills that, that UPMIS will need, I think um, I, I like to have it all. So I would say we need Stephen's extroverts, but actually they need to be expert too, because um, as UPCREP, UPMIS, um, expanded its um, conversations with the European Parliament, which is now the most open of the EU institutions, I think. The one thing that was very clear was that your conversation would only last 10 minutes if you weren't also expert. So I think we're after the holy grail of people who are both extrovert and 
expert. Um, the good news is that in my time in um, UCREP and UCMIS, I met, managed and worked with plenty of those. I think the thing that they will also need is the ability to plug back into Whitehall and to encourage that conversation in Whitehall about what it is you want to do with the relationship with the European Union, because as a third country, influencing is that much harder. So you need to be more strategic and more selective. You need to know what your interests are. You need to know whether your interests are collaboration, competition, or just watching um, and monitoring. Um, and I think you know, that element is gonna be really important. Um, I think it could well prove to be quite tough uh, initially, but I think Stephen is right that over time, actually Whitehall will realise that, that the European Union matters. But I think we will need people who are going to be quite punchy back into Whitehall departments. It's always been true that the popularity of the EU work has ebbed and flowed in, 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 in Whitehall. You know, I think there's a risk now that people will say, well, the negotiations are over, we can disband all these teams and people who became um, experts in it. Um, I think holding, holding, the, um, holding Whitehall to account is gonna be quite an important part, particularly in the early years and as that understanding of the importance of engagement with um, the EU starts to come back. Katrina, just a question. We've got a few people commenting on the fact, I mean, Matt's report was focusing on UCREP, not what we might call DevReps or the devolved administration's representations in, in Brussels. But, you know, are, are they still there? Are they going to change their role? And particularly, you're working now with the Scottish government. Uh, are they building up their representation? They're still there. Um, actually, one of the things um, that um, each of the offices of the devolved administrations uh, said to me as we were doing the work on what it would be like to be up this is we have experience in what you will need because we have always been sitting there drawing people's attention, um, you know, bringing something to the table, having to make the running to make ourselves interesting. Um, and certainly, uh, as far as I know, there are no plans to diminish the size of any of the devolved administration offices. Um, the um, Scottish government office is the largest of those. Um, we will obviously have to see what happens after the um, Scottish elections in May. Um, but in a way, the, the devolved administration offices have provided a bit of a template uh, for how you start to have those conversations and how you start to, to, to influence in a slightly different way. And are you feeding in at all to UCMIS uh, in that sense? Or is there any sense in which the UK is using, uh, using the devolved perhaps influence, maybe less conflictual relationship with the EU in a strategic way? Um, I mean, the, of the offices in Brussels have always worked very closely together. Um, and, you know, actually throughout my time in UCREP and then UCMIS, um, regardless of the politics, there was a kind of sense that if we could work together to magnify the common messages, then that was a good thing to do. So, you know, I, I certainly think there is, there is scope to, there's scope to do that. Um, you, you do feel that much further away from the domestic politics when you're, you're based in Brussels, I have to say. Okay, Katrina, I've got a question I'm not going to ask you, but I am going to ask Stephen, and I don't know whether Ulf has any observations on it as an outsider. Um, this argument with the EU over the status of its embassy in, like, its representation in London, and the stories we hear out of Brussels that there's a sort of slight tit for tat on denying some access, at least early on, to Lindsay Appleby, you know, is, is that a real problem? And a more general issue Sandra Kaduri raises about, you know, do you think when you look at the current setup with David Frost there, that UCMIS will be able to challenge back to the Prime Minister, the Foreign Secretary, to others about, you know, 
how UK initiatives are landing in Brussels, which after all used to be one of the big functions of the permanent representative, who used to have pretty good access to the prime minister and senior ministers when they came to uh, came out to Brussels for various councils. Do you see a different sort of docking role of influencing, uh, which makes Uckermiss, in a sense, face a harder task of landing its messages back into Whitehall? Oh, no, first point. I think it does matter. My understanding is that the reason why Lindsay was denied access was because of our behaviour towards Raul Valdelmeda, the EU representative. And, you know, it's completely petty and ludicrous on the part of the government to be uh, behaving in this uh, in this way. And, and you know, if we go out of our way to, to poke the EU in the eye, then we can expect, um, uh, we can expect a, a response. I, think, I mean, I think, you know, it's... It, it, making making messages receivable to a government in government in power is, is always difficult and and, uh, and obviously much more difficult now for a government that's taken us out of uh, uh, of the uh, EU uh, has Eurosceptics at its at its head and in and in David David Frost somebody who was at least assumed that assumed that uh, that uh, mantle though I can't say that when he and I worked together in Accra we ever had any of those existential uh, discussions so I think it's going to be it is going to be a harder task and I and I think probably for for a few years at least it is going to be hard to to make those to make those uh, to make those messages uh, and but as mm. it, this is it, it's a it's a it's a change of degree mm. rather than rather than something mm. which, which is brand new in terms of diplomacy. Stephen, it might mm. be helpful if you could just turn up your volume or something like that. We're finding you harder to hear than everybody, everybody else. It's I'm just not sure I, I'm not sure I can do it. Well, um, the, shout. Uh, the quiet, the okay. quiet, sp sure. quiet spoken but effective diplomat. Ulf, um, just sort of interested here, and in, uh, what's the sort of Norwegian sort of if we've talked about the Norwegians and the way they operate in, uh, in Brussels, do they have any sort of, uh, you know, problems in getting European issues taken seriously back in Oslo, or is it so obvious it matters so much uh, that, uh, that they don't have any problems at all? Uh, we have lots of difficulties but with that. But let me just say one thing before I respond to that. Say one word regarding the question you asked to Stephen, because I think this is uh, a key issue. And it relates, everything boils down to the issue of trust and trustworthiness. Uh, because it, um, in, a, in any relationship, you need some kind of trust. And typically, if you don't have trust, you build some institutions. Oh, we've lost uh, you again. Uh, now the UK have a relationship with the, with the EU that is not based on... Okay. Oops. Can you hear me, Jim? Uh, yeah, you keep cutting out, though, so... Okay, I'm sorry for that. Uh, I'm double-checking. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, sorry. So I was saying the issue of trust, and I think this is a big, uh, big issue. Um, now, uh, so we I think you may need to turn your camera off. Oh. So that's not that's not working. I think. I think we okay. might need to get you to come. Stand. Uh, does that help? A bit. Can you hear me better now? Yes, yes. Okay, I'm sorry for that. Okay, so I, what I said was just the issue of trust is really important. The UK and the EU have to engage in a big exercise to establish trust and establish trustworthiness. Uh, historically, the UK has been very influential in the EU and a much appreciated partner and decision making in the EU, also for a country like Norway, where but the Brexit process have kind of uh, established some doubts about the trustworthiness uh, of the UK and whether they will uh, stick to their positions, etc. So I think this this is something that uh, that would be difficult to deal with. Now, uh, two or three points related to the competence and also the uh, bringing back uh, linking up to to Oslo or to Norway. Two or three counterintuitive things that we in Norway, but also the Swiss have experienced. The first is that as a non-member, you somehow have to know the files better at an, uh, an, at an earlier stage than some of the member states. 
right? So that's so you, it's more demanding in terms of expertise. Yet it's more difficult to build that expertise. The second observation is that mm. as a non-member in trying to influence the EU, you somehow have to argue more European. You have to endorse the general principles, but at the same time try to argue, oh, but at the same time we would like to have some kind of exception or some special things. But you have to kind of move very positively towards the general European agenda. And I think uh, this is very uh, slightly counterintuitive because as an EU member, the UK will say, okay, we can be lazy on the information, but at the end of the day, it will end up at our desk and we'll have a vote. Or as an EU member, you can say, uh, we will reject, we will stop this. But now things are slightly different. So, uh, and, uh, and then finally, to the point of bringing back the capital, uh, this is as important for non-members as it is for EU members, but it's much more difficult because politicians don't pay much attention to what is going on in Brussels. And since politicians are not traveling, media is not traveling. So there's no attention related to the issue. Uh, so uh, really good experts in the Norwegian uh, uh, foreign office or at the delegation, they send reports back home, but they are often not read. That's and they very... don't they, and they don't get instructions on what to say they keep demanding in Oslo give us instructions we have an opportunity to influence what what should be our view and they don't hear anything so all throughout that Katrina was nodding very vigorously and Katrina I know uh, did some of the work thinking about how alchemists need to change obviously the UK is in a different position as some people have pointed out we're not a member of the EEA so we're not in that sense a direct rule taker what we do know that the EU will set quite a lot of the regulatory environment that's relevant for our business. Somebody on the uh, somebody in the Q and A has asked whether maybe business uh, has an important role in getting the message across to government that some of this engagement in the EU matters and matters to them. But Katrina, what thinking have you done about the sort of different way of working in UCMIS? That some of the points that Ulf has been making there. Yes, I mean, I think um, Ulf's point about um, needing to influence earlier if you're outside is really resonant. His points about it being more difficult, uh, which is related to the point I was making earlier about being selective. Um, and I think the work we, we did in UCREP and then UCMIS very much looked at how you can use different voices to um, put different parts of your message across. And for example, we spent a certain amount of time talking to business and in particular businesses who had an interest in the UK, but actually had enterprises elsewhere in the EU, say in Belgium or in Sweden, and about how you could work with them to help those messages about the direction of travel get, get through. So I think I would endorse everything that all said about the need to, to use multiple channels, everything he said about the need to get in early, um, and actually recognize very much that issue of how do you get in with ministers when they are not coming to Brussels? And the fascinating thing has been talking during the pandemic to um, my former DPR colleagues, who of course are still in Kurupa, and the way in which the council's going virtual has made it more difficult for them to have those conversations that you just have with the minister when they're sitting next to you in a, in a council meeting. So that issue about how you get the traction, I think, is going to be um, a big challenge. And a, a very specific question to you, Katrina, from Lisa, Lisa Clare Whitten about Northern Ireland. What thinking was done when you were there when the protocol was negotiated and obviously some EU directives still apply in Northern Ireland, that big list. What thinking were you giving to actually how you made sure Northern Ireland's concerns were taken seriously in, uh, in Brussels? And we've also got the sort of joint committee set up and things like that. We, we, we did a great deal of thinking about that. And I think perhaps the most important thing that we did 
was making sure that at all stages we were explaining to our EU, then EU colleagues and to the Commission, the fact that some of this would continue to apply in Northern Ireland. Because um, although um, it felt like the whole debate was about Brexit, actually, most of the diplomats who were negotiating on behalf of the member states on other dossier, um, and indeed most of the people who were working in the Commission, but not in the UK task force, um, had a broad appreciation of what was happening, but did not understand that there were specific parts of this that would continue to apply in relation to, to, to Northern Ireland. So actually getting that message out there was, was, extremely, was extremely important, you know, and that with the thinking that we did, we did with London on all of this, you know, was one of the most important elements for us. And Katr Katrina, just a bit of a niche question for you quickly. Uh, from Michael Roberts, what does an UCMIS desk officer now actually do? What does a day look like as opposed to what it used to look like? Someone who would have, you know, gone to been preparing working groups, reading papers for working groups. What do they do? Do they just buy cups of coffee for people? And um, you know, Funnily enough, out? if if, if there are any UCMISs on the line, they might remember this. We did a kind of day in the life exercise where we worked out what we thought people's day would look like. Um, actually, they would still do a certain amount of, of um, reading of papers. Um, they would use the, some of the time that was liberated from sitting in um, very fascinating working groups uh, to do more that was about going to um, events, third country events, other member states events, networking, um, more that was about the hospitality budget, the coffees, the lunches, those kinds of things. Um, and actually um, quite a lot of work with Whitehall departments to think about the thing that you could put on the table that would make the UK interesting to the EU and where actually uh, there might be scope for you to work together. Um, the most obvious area being an area like um, research and development, where, of course, the aspiration was to be part of Horizon Europe. So um, if, if, my, if Michael would be really interested in it and knowing if it's the Michael Roberts I know, I'm sure he would be interested. Um, I could send I could, we could I could arrange for him to be sent some of the templates we did about day in the life. All right. Well, that sounds that sounds very interesting. Generally, we'll have to get you to write a blog for the UK and the Changing Europe uh, blog on the day and life of someone from Uckmist to to do this. Um, we've got a question a question in here about um, about working Jill, with other. Yeah, Jill. I think Stephen was trying to say something. Oh, Stephen, maybe, come in. Yeah, maybe Sorry, muted. Stephen, I'm not sure it will prove a valid model, but when I was in Accra, it transpired that for quite a long time, a member of the Israeli delegation to the EU had been regularly attending one of the working groups on international trade. <laughs> well, now we can all just hack into everybody else's Zoom calls. Well, on that's another right variant to... on a day in the life, isn't it? <laughs> but I just wanted to ask, there's some questions here. Uh, maybe for all, uh, we had a question about how far you use Sweden to get inside information as perhaps your closest uh, potential partner and other countries here about working with other third countries and how far that was an important dimension. Is there anything like a sort of network of third countries? Because obviously people have differing relations with the EU, the Norwegian relations are different from the Swiss relationship, different from the Canadian relationship, but is there a sort of collective of third countries, Ulf, that uh, works together on issues? No, I don't think there's a collective of third countries, but uh, Norway work very closely with many of the member states. So um, maybe this is not so official and I shouldn't say it, but I, I think there's an element in the fact that uh, Norwegians get a bit of documents from the Swedes and the Swedes get a bit of NATO documents from the Norwegians, <laughs> those kind of exchanges. Uh, the UK, for instance, been a uh, very um, uh, active uh, and strong partner of Norway. For instance, Norwegian membership in European Defence Agency would never have been possible without advocacy from the UK. Um, uh, and those kind of things. Uh, so the Nordics are important for Norway, the Netherlands, the UK, Germany, etc. Uh, we don't work that closely with Switzerland. Uh, and uh, apart from that, there's not that many... Uh, 
uh, non-members that we have close relationship with in Europe, right? Because and Iceland, we are of course cooperate a bit with Iceland in the, in the EFTA, but uh, that's more we have very different interests than Iceland. Uh, the, uh, Katrina said something interesting uh, about uh, uh, businesses that can help to promote UK mm -hmm. interests. Uh, let me say just one thing, observation there from Norway, and also consistent with the research literature. You know, one of the things that happens when a country leaves the EU or are not a member of the EU is that the government loses its privileged position as representing national interests. Uh, so, uh, uh, multiple actors, businesses and firms in Norway, they try to influence the EU as well. Often they try to advocate also what they say is the interest of Norway, although it's not the interest of the Norwegian government. Uh, and in fact, many of these businesses find it easier to try to shape Norwegian policy developments by influencing the EU. So they run counter to Norwegian government interests. Uh, and so I think this will also be the case in the UK. Uh, when it's becoming a lobbyist, the UK government is just one out of many mm. lobbyists from the UK. And in some sense, power is shifting from Whitehall and being diverse into the UK society. And some of these actors will have more closely uh, networks and participation mm. in different unions than UK government. So Stephen, um, on this, I mean, quite a lot of people have been pointing out, of course, the UK is in a different position to Norway, uh, not affected in the same way. Um, who would you be looking to sort of build a lot? Would you be looking to build alliances, say, with the Canadians or the US or other, you know, more genuine third countries? Or if you were posted to Brussels, what would you be your strategy for, for influencing well, I think, I mean, I, I think the, the actually, the, I mean, the, and the, the US mission is, is itself worth looking at because it is, it is obviously, it is obviously huge and has always had, you know, played a very, very uh, influential, influential role. I mean, I think as, as an aside from that, I mean, I think British policy will now hew more towards the United States again, especially with the Biden administration. And I think you know, that old temptation to always try and look across the Atlantic as America's best partner will, will, will be there. And to some, to an extent on issues like Russia and China, that may put us at loggerheads with our, with our former with our former partners i mean i don't i mean i i don't i don't see an obvious an, an obvious model i think it, i think a better a better model is actually is actually the relationships you you conduct with those who are member states and and getting a commonality of interest i mean there are some areas for example and we see it already with Mr. Coveney, the Irish Foreign Minister, only 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 this week, pointing out the extent to which what we've just uh, what we've just done is a slap in the face to them because they've been trying to smooth the way for us uh, in Brussels, partly of course and mainly because it's also in their it's also in their own interest. So I think I think I think we're trying try. I mean, uh, the, uh, Pierre de Boissier, who was the French permanent representative and, and latterly Secretary of the Council. Uh, said to me often that you know you guys have got to make yourself liked again. You know people have got to want to do business uh, with you, and that does that does actually mean trying to find areas of cooperation which may be bilateral areas primarily rather than EU areas. And France is an obvious uh, um, candidate there in terms of the defence of the defence relationship. Um, and then using that when you actually need to drill in for a particular EU issue which is of, of concern to you. And obviously, there's no there is uh, there is no guarantee. But I think, and I think the other thing, the other thing again is, I mean, I, I think the big, you know, the big difference between them and I was there and, and now is, is the fact that the, you know, the, the European, of, of, of all the institutions, the European Parliament is now, in my view, the most powerful. And the European Union, as we've been discussing, is the most accessible uh, as well. And no legislation can pass without the European Parliament. And the opportunity of influencing there is very great. I worked for a time for a public affairs co company in Brussels. And we were very effective on behalf of companies in actually influencing the course of legislation in, in the European in the European Parliament. So what's that? So I'm interested in that. Uh, we've got quite a few questions about sort of encouraging links between politicians, uh, between parliamentarians. The Trade and Cooperation Agreement has this sort of provision for this interparliamentary forum. Stephen, you know, do you think that's an important thing to do, building links between parliamentarians? 
or should the UK government support it? Is it doing enough to support that? Um, it is, but I think it is. Yeah, I think I think it is. I think it is important because again, it's uh, you know every, every, you need every lever of influence that you can find. One of the things that I, unless it unless it improved, I, from from Matt's report, it clearly hadn't, uh, which we always <laughs> did rather badly actually was was having. Uh, close relationships between British ministers and their and their and their EU partners outside meetings of the uh, uh, of the council. Uh, my sense always was that most of our partners were much better at, at, uh, at doing that, at picking up the phone, at going to visit each other, and actually est establishing the kind of relationship where you could, uh, you know, possibly uh, strike deals. Um, British ministers tended to uh, to want to get back on the on the plane or the train as as as, as, uh, as fast as possible, and I think it was a, it was consistently a real uh, uh, a failing in our in the way we are in the in the way we operated. There was a brief period when Labour came in in ninety seven, and we we're about to uh, have a, a presidency when they really really worked worked hard at it. But then, you know, it gradually it gradually faded, and obviously the more so when under Gordon Brown and then naturally under the Conservatives, it became sort of us versus them. And Stephen, you have a brilliant story in Matt's report, I think, about how unseriously our political parties took the European Parliament. That's, that's an old, that's a rather old story. Dates from the I know, but I can't resist it. So, when, so good. When the European Parliament voted to condemn the British presidency, which came to an end in, 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 in December, uh, of 86, I think it was. And part of the reason why the vote went, the con condemning Britain went through was because the Conservative MEPs were off rehearsing their Christmas pantomime. But of course that wouldn't happen these days. So uh, so anyway, Matt, do you want to come in on parliamentary, importance of parliamentary links, which you touch on in your report? Yes, yeah, so I, th I think it, there are some positive signs here in the sense that as far as I'm aware, except for the Conservatives, most or other major parties in the UK still remain part of the European families, which is positive for ma maintaining those soft kind of informal links in future. As I said, the, the, the inter-parliamentary forum is a really important thing, I think, especially at the level of kind of committee chairs in the UK. If they can build links with their European Parliament uh, counterparts, that's a really useful relationship for both sides to have. Um, these people are, are extremely influential at EU level. I think that's often not appreciated among political actors in the UK. Is you know, if you if you're chairing a committee, you have a very very strong influence over the eventual shape of the EU legislation. So I think if you are a, a senior parliamentarian in the UK, you have interest in in speaking to these people and building links, um, both for your own personal uh, sort of political network, but also because. If you have ambitions to have, for this relationship to be functional and productive in the future, these are the, you know having these soft connections are very useful for building mutual understanding. I think that's what we've seen break down throughout the Brexit process. Really, is a sense of knowing how how each other think, understanding it, and then also internalizing it. And I think partly the, the kind of um, Ferrari over over Northern Ireland and, and and the EU's export mechanism was, I think, partly pointing to the the fact that the, these mutual understandings aren't as deep as perhaps we thought they were after the Brexit process, and they need to be built up and, and built upon in future. Okay, I want to, uh, moving towards the end now, we will finish at uh, 7.15, uh, let you all go off to dinner or whatever else fun is available while we're still in lockdown. Um, I wanted to move to a sort of our top rated question, uh, which has been sitting there for ages from Denisa Delich. Um, which is about the integrated review. She's asking about what's the panel's view of the missing UK-EU foreign policy cooperation framework. Um, what are the, some of the implications of that for European security? But I just wondered if we could broaden that into a question about, uh, I might make this a final question to all of you, give you a bit more time to think about it, is does the UK need a sort of EU-Europe strategy um, about where we want this relationship to go. Do we think we have one uh, that we've seen? And should that encompass things that go beyond the TCA? The UK notably rejected the idea of a formal sort of pillar around foreign and security cooperation in the trade and cooperation agreement um, when we did it. Um, um, Katrina, you may not want to say too much about UK foreign policy, but I wonder whether you thought 
we had an adequate view and process for landing on what actually are our priorities now. We can't influence everything. We're not always in the room. A lot of things we won't care about. But, you know, do we have a proper process internally now for thinking about what the UK's priorities in that relationship are? I think the establishment of um, a Europe Secretariat, um, or I think it's going to be called the EU Secretariat in the Cabinet Office, is, is actually the start of the realisation that that, that that is what um, we now need to do. Um, those of us who are very long in the tooth um, kind of... Um, smiled wryly when um, that decision was announced because there used to be something called the European Secretariat in the Cavernous Office of which at one point Stephen was the head and I was the deputy head. Um, and actually, I, I, think, I think there is a recognition that the corralling of the pieces of the relationship, that, that sort of process of deciding what, what it is you want to do with the EU and in what way, um, you know, is 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 an important thing. Is it there yet? No, I don't. I don't think so. I mean, in a way, having just completed the uh, negotiations, um, I wouldn't expect it to be. But I, I do think that provides the footings uh, for for that kind of approach. Matt, do you think we need a an explicit Europe strategy? I think so. And I also think it would help to call it a Europe strategy rather than an EU strategy, given the politics at the minute. Um, but I, what I would like to see more from the government really is an, is an appreciation of it, of the importance, not just of the EU, but of Europe as a region and of surrounding regions. All the emphasis is shifting towards the Indo-Pacific, but actually our core interests, economic and security, are in Europe and surrounding regions. So I think if that's the framing of it, that's more useful. It obviously brings NATO into it as well. Um, but there's a sort of a gaping hole in, in the integrated review, which is th there's an elephant in the room that, that, that it dances around, which is the EU, which has to be a core part of that. But I think if it's part of a wider Europe strategy and Europe and surrounding region strategy, then it's probably politically more uh, digestible than explicitly saying, OK, our priority is the EU, which obviously isn't politically, but it's clearly important and it should be a central part of a wider strategy, I think. Oh, does mm. Norway have a... Europe strategy, capital E, capital S, or? Yeah, it's Europe. Uh, it's not the EU. Uh, I think uh, it's natural and uh, quite likely also, I see, that the UK, the EU, and Norway and other like-minded countries come together and coordinate a bit more uh, in areas of foreign security and defense policy. And uh, not uh, so it's natural somehow that Europe have uh, some shared positions on on China, on Russia, on terrorism, on cyber issues and illicit uh, crime, etc. So, and uh, and uh, this is also consistent with uh, what we see uh, the, the development in uh, international affairs, where economic issues, technology issues are becoming more important, and some of these are core. Uh, our exclusive competence of the EU in uh, also in trade issues, etc. So I, I think it's natural that the UK, uh, that the EU relates to partners that are not members of the EU, but that are like-minded. And of course, uh, from Norway, we have benefited from a strong foreign security policy and defense cooperation with the UK for, for many years, decades. And, and and that is just uh, being strengthened these days. So, uh, but but I think that uh, as you remember, Theresa May she launched this idea of a comprehensive treaty with the EU, a partnership on uh, on uh, in security and defense and foreign policy that fell uh, fell apart. But I think that at some point in time these things will be brought up. And also, I think that the NATO NATO EU cooperation. Will will push in that direction. Stephen, final word. Yeah, you I, looked at the integrated review. Well, Did you think, think there's something missing here? I mean, I think if you and if and if you look at it, I mean, if 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 as we rightly identify, the, the biggest challenges, if not threats, to us at the moment come from the rise of China as the world's dominant superpower, uh, and from Russia. Where would you look? In dealing with those things, but to the other democracies, and the other democracies happen to be our, our neighbours, 
prominent democracies happen to be our neighbors uh, in, uh, uh, in Europe. And if you take it even to a sort of micro level, if you're Caroline Wilson, our ambassador in China, sitting in China under horrendous pressure from the, from the Chinese, where would you look for support? You would look support locally from your fellow Europeans who share your values and might be prepared to come uh, in with your support. So it seems to me it's, it, it has to be, it has to be, we have to get there. We may, it'll take some time to get there, but uh, it would be, I think all roads actually do lead back to Europe. I don't necessarily mean to membership of the EU, but all roads do lead back to Europe, it seems. Okay, well, that's a point on which to end. I think one of the big messages from this is, uh, is we do need to retain and build that, you know, thing which was perhaps not in as much supply as it should have been. That's what some of our uh, reports suggest, which is EU expertise. That good news for everybody watching from UCMIS, you will continue to play a very important role. And I think people here think your role will get bigger and more important over time. So do hang in there. Uh, but I wanted to end by saying uh, thanks to everybody for all those comments and questions in the chat. Uh, two big strands in the chat that I haven't highlighted on, the number of people commending Stephen's book and the number of people commending Matt's report. So do read both. Uh, Matt's report is available on our website. Stephen's, I'm sure, from all good booksellers. Do, as Matt said, look out for our Brexit Witness archive. Uh, we are interviewing some officials and do have some interesting ones to be released shortly before we go into Perda. So do check that out for very interesting perspectives. But can I thank most of all, all our panelists for contributing to a very excellent chat and uh, helping us launch Matt's very important report. So thank you all very much. And very many apologies to everybody who just had to watch a whirring wheel uh, owing to button failure earlier. But thanks so much for hanging in there. And sorry for those of you on YouTube who watched the intro twice. So uh, we won't do that again. Uh, probably won't be allowed to chair an event again. Thanks very much, everybody. And good night. Thanks very much. <laughs>